Hello, everyone. Great to have you back to our Lunch with Larry Masterclass series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about electrical simulation. So we're going to talk about both pre and post layout simulation and uh, manufacturability of our boards. So excited to have you here today to talk uh, to have the discussion. Great, great to have you here. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little. This is my typical slide I put up for contact information. If you want to get a hold of me. Uh, any way possible. Uh, all of my contact information is here. We are also have a QR code for our next series. Our next series is going to be on digital health. Uh, how is it that we define our project management for digital health, for doing software development, and also design authoring, so uh, software authoring using our Mendix tools. So looking forward to that series. Uh, and if you would like to register for that or think there's someone in your organization that might be interested, this is the QR code and the uh, link so you can get on that registration page. So we'd love to have you as part of that series as well. Uh, just as a matter of uh, housekeeping, we have this also have this historical webinar location. And the reason we put that up is as we go through this series, and today we're going to talk about um, some things that lead up to simulation. We've done a lot of these topics uh, about the lead up top topics. And so if you wanted to for instance, uh, get a video on authoring the electrical design or how this relates to risk management and uh, requirements management. Uh, we have quite a few assets there and be happy to have you jump into those assets, take a look around and uh, follow uh, to your heart's content the topics you're interested in. So just wanted to bring that up for you. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we're, I'm building out over, uh, excuse me, over the whole uh, product life cycle, we're building out this example around the Medtronic open source ventilator uh, data. And so I just wanted to also mention that as we're doing every one of these webinars, what we're doing is we're building out the data model with this common ventilator uh, data set. And today we're gonna talk about doing simulation on the CPU board as an example, as part of this ventilator data set. And so what you would expect to see as you go through these webinars is the pieces that are required to put together the design for the entire product life cycle. And not just the ventilator box itself. So this isn't just a box build project, but in addition to that, we're also looking at product simulation around the disposable. So the interface between the box and the patient, uh, how to model patients, how to model uh, from a systems engineering perspective, loading conditions, that kind of thing. So just wanna be sure that you understand the scope of this project is much bigger than what you're going to see today. So feel free to go back to that webinar uh, series and see if there's other topics that are interesting to you. And we'll reference those as we go through. So really got a great session prep for you today. Uh, ben is our uh, electrical engineer who has five years with the Minographics design tools. And so maybe, Ben, you could introduce yourself, your expertise and your background. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion with you today. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So I'm an application engineer. Um, I started working with Mentor Graphics and now Siemens, and I've been around for about five years. And I specialize in Siemens Electrical Tool Suite, um, Expedition, Hyperlinks, and Valor. Mainly my focus is on PCB design and analysis. Oh, fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the, the presentation over. So okay. what we've done today is we've uh, sort of canned a few questions because a lot of this uh, preparation is necessary for this discussion around simulation. So I'm going to lay out a few questions for Ben and hopefully we'll have a great conversation around this. So the first question is really when creating the digital twin, uh, men are emphasize uh, a, a left, a digital, you know, a, a shifting left philosophy. Maybe you could help us to understand what that shift left philosophy is and, and provide us some context. Yeah. So here kind of using this block diagram. Um, every every product has a start and a beginning, and if we're just going along with the way we read, the start's at the left side and the end is on the right. And every product has a review stage, which is these feedback loops. And with left shifting, we try to eliminate these feedback loops or make them as small as possible because each feedback loop is cost and time. It's an expenditure. Um, so when you're making a printed circuit board, you have analysis tools that every step along the way, you can do schematic analysis, layout analysis. Um, when the layout's finished, you can do post layout analysis. Um, so the left shift philosophy is kind of checking early and often, um, using the right tool at the right time to ensure that you have this design cycle that is as short as possible and as low risk as possible to have first time success on your circuit boards. 
And so, and Kat, yeah, so, um, so we're gonna start with pre-layout simulation. And just so everybody knows, you know, this is before we actually do the layout. So we're gonna start talking about uh, general topics here before we actually get into the ventilator model. And so maybe what you could do is walk us through the process of this pre-layout analysis, what you can do before the board's even laid out. Yep, before laying out the board, you're going to want to find constraints. And there's lots of rules of thumb that dictate these constraints, but it's better to have actual quantitative data to ensure that your board will be successful. So before even going to the layout, you may want to ask yourself what type of stack up should I use? What type of trace width will give me a 50 ohm characteristic impedance? What type of spacing between traces is needed to ensure that I don't have large amounts of crosstalk? How long can I run traces uh, next to each other to, um, to make sure I don't have enough, well, don't have crosstalk? So using hyperlinks line sim, this is a pre-layout tool. It's schematic driven, very similar to any spice tool out there and what we can look at here is basic transmission lines so you may have an integrated circuit it may have a trace which is modeled as a transmission line and then another ic and you can look at the channel characterization between these two uh, drivers and receivers but before anything gets started you'll want to start with a, a stack up that will be the the backbone of your board and it will determine all the characteristic impedances of your traces and things like that so within LineSim, we have a stack up editor and you can enter the layers of your board. You can predict which ones will be planes. And from those planes layers, you can apply test widths to find, okay, if I wanted this 80 ohm characteristic impedance, maybe I wanna use a six mil trace on that layer. So that's how you can get started determining what type of board, what's feasible for um, your layout. And the first thing to look at is, okay, let's just put a signal on this line and run it through a trace and see what we get on the other line. So I'll do that through a, just a transient analysis here in LineSim. And I'm looking at U1 and U2. So I just want those checked, U1 and U2. So I'll send a signal down that channel and let's see what we get out of it. I'll turn the time frame up a bit. So here we'll start that simulation and we see Red is the driver and green is the receiver, and we get a lot of oscillation. This is an underdamped circuit, and that that's crossing logic thresholds there as well. Um, and that could be very, very problematic. So there are a few things we can do. Um, one thing is probably to terminate the circuit. Um, and so in another little example here I have drawn up, I'm adding a series termination here, but I don't know what is the correct value, or what's the right value. So another simple thing you can do here in line sim is do sweeps. So I could take this passive component here, R2, and I can apply some sweeps to it. So here I've set up the sweeps from zero ohms, just make this a wire to 100 ohms, and I'm doing five sweeps to look at what's the optimal value for this resistor to damp that circuit properly. So I'll go ahead and run this one more time with these sweeps. And I want it to look at the values of U9 and U10. So let's take a look. Here we have U9, that's the driver, and U10 is the receiver. And if I hover over these, I can see what R2 value was used. Zero ohms, 25 ohms, 50 ohms looks like the optimally damped case. These ones might be over damped with 100 ohms. So that's one, one um, thing you can determine before even going to layout, if what type of termination you'll need given this trace or transmission line impedance and length. Another area that you might be interested in is the crosstalk on the board. What type of trace to trace spacing do you need? These two traces or transmission lines are coupled and they're given a trace to trace separation of eight mils. So that can be helpful in determining constraints and spacing in your constraint manager of expedition or whatever layout tool you're using. So let's look at this simulation. I'll fire a signal off of U3 and look at the results of that signal at U6. U5 is set as a low. Let's run an interactive simulation one more time. And I'll look at U3 and also U6. So we're getting a lot of this, this signal here, a lot of crosstalk enough to cross a, uh, a voltage threshold. 
And so that's, that would be very problematic. So we could either space these out, but another thing that's worth trying is just, let's terminate that line. So I'll add a resistor into the schematic and this resistor. We decided that 50 ohms was the optimal case from our previous simulation there. And let's add this one into the circuit we were testing and see if that's helpful. Okay, and we'll simulate this one more, one more time. So I'll turn on the previous results as well, and we can see, okay, although it's not great, this no longer crosses the voltage threshold any longer. And so kind of just at a brief summary, LineSim is a great place to explore trade-offs that you have in your design prior to going to layout. And once you find the optimal trade-offs, you can enter those as constraints to drive the layout as well. So that kind of concludes what I wanted to show with pre-layout analysis. Yeah, sure. And one of the, so as you're developing your schematic and you're uh, using this tool, the next step would then be to uh, actually build out the board that you have. So this is our example from the ventilator. This is our CPU board yeah. that's been built out in one of our previous uh, discussions. And so when you're laying out the board, can you show us then uh, what can be done to guarantee that this board, when we come out, with, come out with the first spin, it, that it's going to be functional as we expect it to be. Yeah, there's several analysis tools that can be done while laying out the board and after the board's completed. Um, one of which is Hyperlinks DRC. And Hyperlinks DRC has about 80 DRC checks uh, and rules that can be applied to the board while you're routing or after the board's complete. And what's great about Hyperlinks DRC is that these checks, these 80 or so, they automate tasks that are not difficult. It's kind of like if you're trying to find Waldo, everyone could find Waldo in two to three minutes on a page, but doing that a thousand times, that really adds up. And so what Hyperlinks DRC does is it automates those tasks. So if I wanted to have something like a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, I would just run this check on a group of line, a group of nets that should have 50 ohm characteristic impedance. You have prerequisites, you'll have a group of nets, and then you'll have parameters like target impedance on them. Some very popular checks that I'll show today are um, nets crossing gaps and a stitching via check. And so let's take a look at what nets crossing gaps might do. You'll get a short PowerPoint overview of the rule. And what's problematic when you cross a gap is you'll have a change in the characteristic impedance and that will cause a impedance discontinuity, which will cause a reflection. Um, also, if several traces are crossing the same gap, they may share a return path for the current. And then you might have simultaneous switching noise, which will degrade your signal performance. Um, and so what I wanted to look at is this nets crossing gaps rule. I've created a group of address nets in my design, which are A0 through A23. And I'll go ahead and run this rule on the design. It's, it's quick, execute the rule. And we can take a look at the three violations that it found. I'll just go ahead and cross probe to this violation. Here we have a crossing of a split. Um, I could look at the other violation, another crossing of the split. And the last one, this one also crosses the split. And here's one of those problems that, that we may encounter. Um, yes, you have an impedance con discontinuity, which will cause a reflection, but these three traces are both crossing the split. And not only does the rule find the split, it also looks to see if there's any stitching nearby to allow a, a clean return path for that signal. And there appears to be none. So these three traces, if they're all firing signals at the same time, they'll probably share a common return path and that could cause switching noise on the line, which will be something you'll need to investigate further. Another nice rule that's very popular is a stitching via check. So let's take a look at that PowerPoint slide. This one is the case where let's say you have a signal on layer one and it's referencing a plane on layer two. Let's call that plane ground. And you go through a via and out of that via, let's say the signal comes out layer six and the plane you reference on layer five, it may be ground or it may be um, VCC. If it's ground, you'll want a stitching via. So the return path isn't just capacitively through the board, it'll be right through the via for the current. If it's another plane, you may want a stitching component like a capacitor nearby. And so what this check will do is it'll look for situations where that occurs through the via and then look within a certain radius to see if, is there any, any stitching nearby? 
And so I'll go ahead and run this check on the address lines. And so we have several. Um, this one's saying in this reference area, it enters on ground and comes out referencing the 24 volt rail. And so within this radius, there's a red circle around here. There's no stitching component, uh, no stitching capacitor nearby. So what's, what's great about hyperlinks DRC is that it can give you this kind of preliminary checks that need to be investigated further, um, as well as identifying the root cause of problems. Oftentimes you may get a waveform that you've, um, you've run transient analysis on, and you'll see it, it doesn't look like that perfect step function that you might want it to be. The source of that problem might be hard to identify through just a um, just uh, looking at the layout, but this hyperlinks DRC tool can kind of point you in the right direction of where the problematic areas of traces would be. Um, and so once you're complete with hyperlinks DRC, you can jump into more thorough analysis of the circuit board through hyperlinks board sim. Um, Hyperlinks board sim goes hand in hand with hyperlinks line sim, where line sim is a pre layout tool. Hyperlinks board sim is more of a post layout tool. And it will do the same underlying models we saw with the pre layout line sim, but it extracts it for you conveniently. And so, hyperlinks board sim, you can do SI analysis, PI analysis, CERTES analysis. You can even do 3D electromagnetic analysis. Um, but what I wanted to show today is just a brief uh, PI analysis. We'll take a look at a, a voltage rail, the 3.3 volts. And on that rail, we wanna make sure that all the ICs that are attached to that rail actually get delivered that 3.3 volt voltage. And so here's the plane on the board. And I've done a setup of, I applied a roughly ideal voltage source at the voltage regulator. And then I've applied current sinks at all of my IC pins to look at the effects of voltage drop. So I'll go ahead and simulate this one. It'll take a second. And what we'll get immediately is we'll have this power scope here. And the power scope, it will show us where the voltage drop is. Currently, it's looking at current density, but let's jump to voltage drop first. So here we have the voltage drop and we see we have the voltage supply up here. And as current is drawn, it's drawn through metal, which has a certain resistivity, and you get an IR drop across this voltage plane, or across this plane. And looking at it, the top drop was about 21 millivolts. Um, and let's say you have a very sensitive circuit around here, like an ADC, and uh, you really need a good reference plane. This might be something you need to look into and investigate further. Another nice part about this is that you can look at the current density. Um, here we see large current density spikes right where the voltage regulator was. Um, this might be an area where you talk to the designer of the board and say, hey, could we add a few more vias where this voltage uh, regulator transitions from layer one down to the, the layer this plane is on, signal five. Um, so this is nice for a visual reference and it, it often points out problematic areas. But along with that, what you'll get is a more quantitative report uh, all in this HTML format of, did I pass my max voltage drop, the constraints that you set up while you're setting this up? I did that a bit in the background. And also it tells you vias of max current draw, um, pin and current voltages at each IC pin. Um, so you get a nice report along with the analysis that you can hand off to um, other engineers throughout the company and you can go back and say, okay, did I fix it? This is my previous result, this is my current result. It helps with requirements, then um, you can trace if improvements have been made. The other nice area about uh, hyperlinks board sim is that we can run a, a general batch wizard uh, for looking for signal integrity problems. Um, a lot of the, the analysis done in board sim and hyperlinks in general is all wizard driven. So it, it's very hard to get lost in the steps. It kind of walks you through them and holds your hand. So in this wizard, I wanna run signal integrity and crosstalk analysis on several nets at the same time. Uh, I wanna look at overshoot, ring back, delay and, and crosstalk. So I'm looking at the, I've decided of all the nets in this design, I just wanna look at the address and data nets. And I've applied certain constraints, which can be exported directly from Expedition and they're entered here. And so I have an overall constraint for all these nets um, set up here, 400 millivolts is too much crosstalk. Um, 
And as I run the analysis, it will look at that spreadsheet and you can get it to be on a net by net basis. So if you have very sensitive lines, you can add very stringent restraints to those lines. As I go through this, it's often common that people do not have the right models for parts. Maybe it's an old part that never even had an IBIS model. Um, what's nice about this general batch wizard is that we'll apply a generic model of your choosing to parts that do not have a model already assigned. And so if you're doing a rough analysis, just trying to find problematic areas, a generic model is often good enough to do the job and spot the problematic areas. And so as you run this, you can save the results, you'll get another HTML spreadsheet, and you can save the setup as well. Um, that was shown in this first slide here. Um, because it's 38 nets, it takes a little bit longer to run, maybe five minutes. So I've already have, have, uh, have it all set. And you'll get this report of which nets have passed and which nets have failed, the constraints you've provided. So each tab here has a little bit more detail. This one's delay, overshoot. Let's look at crosstalk and see, okay, within these nets here that pass, they're all underneath that 400 millivolt level. Um, which is, which is really good to see. Um, and so that concludes what I wanted to talk about with uh, hyperlinks. We looked at hyperlinks uh, line sim, which is for pre-layout analysis, hyperlinks DRC, which is, goes hand in hand. It actually can run inside the expedition layout client. And I'll show you Valor in a second, and it's a similar methodology there. Um, and then, where hyperlinks DRC is good at pointing out problematic areas, you could do a more thorough analysis in hyperlinks board sim to, uh, to spot those areas. So I'll kind of jump gears just a second inside of Expedition. And um, we were doing pre and post layout analysis and it was very electrical in its domain, but there's several other areas that you might want to, uh, to look at. You design for reliability, design for manufacturability, um, even before we go to layout, we can do schematic analysis as well. But um, with the time we have today, the last thing I wanted to look into was um, designing for manufacturability. And this is something you probably ask yourself before you even start the board. Are you manufacturing this board through a very high-tech fab house or are you printing it with a 3D printer? Um, that answer to the question, um, the, the answer to that question will really determine what type of board you're laying out. It will really determine the constraints of the board. Um, and so inside this Expedition client, I'm going to run a Valor new product introduction or Valor MPI. And Valor has over a thousand, a few thousand checks, uh, DRCs for the uh, manufacturability of circuit boards and the fabrication of circuit boards. So. What's nice about this is I can run it directly inside Expedition on this ventilator circuit board. And you can take subsets of the, the several thousands of DRCs and run them at each stage of your design process. And that goes hand in hand with that left shift philosophy. So if I have my critical routes complete, I could just run DRCs for my critical route checks. If I've completed all routes, I could run that check along with it. If I'm ready for fabrication, I can run those checks. And if you're familiar with the Expedition environment, you'll oftentimes already have run a few DRC checks. You'll have online DRCs, batch DRCs. And with Valor, it comes up as just another tab here. So it's very easy to pinpoint and cross probe in the design and immediately fix those DRCs. So what I wanted to look at was, let's take a look at this one here. It's a, a check for multiple trace connections. And here's all my violations. And what this one is, is there's two traces coming out of this pad here, um, R59, and this one as well, which could be problematic. And you'll get a little hint here telling you why it is problematic. And it says such a condition can, um, well, additional heat will be need, needed to activate that solder um, on the pad because you'll have the heat dissipation through these two traces. And so if there's not enough heat, maybe you'll see a device that's kind of tombstoned. It doesn't solder correctly to this pad and you have a, a resistor just sticking upwards from this R59 there. So that may be something you wanna look into uh, or, or maybe you adjust your soldering um, temperatures in, in, in that as well. 
it all depends on how you will manufacture the board and what that board house is capable of. Another one that's um, simple to comprehend is the silk screen check. Here we have something like a string overlap. And if I look at this, it looks like it's R16 and R, oops, R20. Um, if this was something that was released out to be manufactured, I'm sure the technician would hate debugging this board because they've just, this text is illegible. Um, so it may have been just a little oversight, but it's something that Valor would check and um, and and point out to be uh, to be corrected. Um, so that goes over just four tools, all in 30 minutes or so. Um, there's several more checks in each and every tool that I showed. This was just a brief overview, but the the goal of all of this is really to to provide you a a tool that can analyze the board at every step along the way so that errors that happen early in the design process don't propagate down the design chain. So you can check early and often and fix problems as they occur in order not to have those long design review feedback loops that are costly and that will cost time and money. Sure. So. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the things that we're going to be talking about later is how to take this simulation. So one of the, you can imagine that each one of these uh, uh, points of, of, of evaluation end up being requirements in your requirements set. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we'd like to do as part of that is to say, you know, we have a, a, a requirement around the electrical engineering design and we're running this simulation to increase the confidence that we're actually gonna pass the verification test when it happens. And so one of the things mm -hmm. that we'll talk about later is really how is it that from a quality management standpoint, we're doing a kappa, we're making a change to the board somehow. How is it that we run through the process of doing impact analysis and look at the testing and see which simulation was done so that when we make a change to the board later, we actually go back, re-execute that uh, simulation to make sure that we're still good. And so I would imagine in these tests, you know, as you're, as you're doing the simulation, uh, you know, referencing the designs becomes really important uh, so that we can get back to that data as time goes along. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Yeah, the um, the the design environment, each file is stored in the printed circuit board folder that it, it came out of. Um, if I wanted to have an update of the design, all it's very simple of, I would just export to hyperlinks SIPI thermal, export to DRC, and that's where you get that revisioning of um, of the designs. And that those versions of the design can be tracked all throughout Team Center when you check in and out the design um, for further analysis. So um, all the setup files are stored there. Each design you can just rely upon the setup file you used previously. Previously, so you really have to set it up once, and then you're good to go throughout the whole product cycle. Um, and Team Center will manage that versioning for you, um, so you can look at at the design at each step along the way and make sure that you're actually improving the design and not um, going down a, a worse path. Yeah, one of the one of the uh, sessions we had a while back was on ECAD MCAD. So as you make the revisions to those uh, designs, not only do you get the electrical checks, but you can do a mechanical check on the packaging as well and have it all integrated really uh, kind of a cool setup. So, all right, well, uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Ben, for that. I'm going to show my screen. We're just going to talk uh, just uh, again. We have this session coming up on digital health. Uh, very excited about it. The first two sessions are really going to be about software development planning. How is it that we do agile software development planning and, and drive the, uh, the requirements into the design and make sure that the design uh, performs as we expected? Second two are going to be on software authoring using our Mendix tool. And so we're going to have a discussion with one of our internal uh, development folks about uh, how to use Mendix in that app in that uh, capacity. And also, uh, we'll the last session we'll talk about low-code software development and get some specifics about how to do uh, this high productivity uh, low-code uh, software development. So thank you everyone so much for coming to and spending your lunch with us, and look forward to you uh, joining us the next time. So thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.